Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And we're going to talk about complexes this week. So Mm. helpful. Okay. Complex theory comes out of Jungian psychology. So that's the psychology that was first... mm, scratched into stone tablets no it was it hasn't um, been that long. A, back in the early 1900s a guy named cg jung carl gustav jung um had a total mental breakdown <laughs> and discovered a whole bunch of stuff about himself and he was a psychologist he was a psychiatrist really and he wrote it all down I, I studied Jungian psychology because Jungian psychology speaks to my soul. It's, it just speaks to me. It works for me. I do not think it's the end all be all of all. I, I think that it, it has some deeply rooted problems. I think anything that comes out of Eurocentric, um, old white men, like, and of course we have to take that with a huge grain of salt and throw out what doesn't work for us. However, I have found that many of the core concepts that um, Papa Carl (laughs) provided, they really work for me. They help me understand who I am. Um, And I have found that really, I I sort of lost my religion at some point. I, I lost a sense of being held by the Christianity, the way that I was brought up in it. It just didn't, the container no longer Mm -hmm. held. And, Psychology came along at a time when I was having a complete um, dissolution. Everything was falling apart. And when it when I found psychology in this old way, this this way that centers psyche, psyche is the Greek for soul. It is not Greek for mind, the way most people think soul, mm-hmm. breath, right? It is when it, when i started studying psychology from the perspective of this is about your your unique experience of just being a a, a point of consciousness in this in wildly unbelievable universe everything started to organize for me that started to help me feel held again feel like there was a, a meaning in my life and so I studied Jungian psychology from this perspective. And there's and a lot to Jungian psychology because I watched you from a, from the middle distance and it was a lot. It, yeah. So I've been studying this now. Well, I first started in my undergrad. So that would be in 2011. Um, and before that, I had just been reading as a, as a lay person. I had read, but I, I started actively studying this as my primary um, focus. And now it's been a decade of you know reading and studying what Jung called complex psychology but then um other people in his life um eventually had him terming it um analytical psychology but the reason he wanted to call it complex psychology is that at the root of his idea is this idea that we have complexes and i think most of us have heard the term complexes it's it's entered sort of a general Um, English lexicon. And most people, I think, hear the word complexes like, oh, you have a complex about it. And they they hear it in a sort of um, derisive tone, like, oh, you have a complex, as if that's a bad thing, as if it's something you should be ashamed of, or you should get rid of it. But Jung really posited the idea of a complex as the a sort of um, <laughs> essential part of being a human. It's it's the energy. The the without complexes, there would be no psychological energy at all. There would be no psyche, and there would therefore be no consciousness. So he was positing it as sort of a 
an atomic level constituent of what it is to be a person. And, he, and we have to take this, it's an art. We have to think about this. It's a way of explaining what it is yeah, to be right. a conscious being. It's not the way. So it's this particular model way. says that as a human, we have complexes in us. So, so what is a complex? Okay. So a, a complex can be explained as like a, uh, okay. Like a, a, a burr, like a little collection of psychological energy of, of affect, of mood, of it's this, like, it's when you feel like something has, has plucked a string in you. Um, you feel yeah, lit up, you've got energy, whether and... you wanted to or mm -hmm. not. It's psychological energy that has sort of formed around a, a certain um, image or has formed around a certain idea. So a really common thing we'll hear is like, oh, you have a father complex or, oh, you have a mother complex. Mm -hmm. So that would be a really normal thing to have because you're a human. Humans are born of parents. Parents exist in the world. The idea of parents exist. It exists as an inner concept and they exist as outer realities. So as you, as you are born and then you grow and you be, you just exist, you experience all the stuff that it means to have a mother or to have a father or to not have a mother or not have a father. And that energy around that topic, it starts to collect. And sometimes, many times, it, we get a collection that um, it doesn't really, it doesn't feel real good all the time. Mm, yeah. So it's a little like um, having a, a, a node. There's like a, a place, like a, a knot in a muscle, mm -hmm. right? Like, um... So your muscle's fine and it's working fine, but you got this like knot here. And yeah, no matter what you right. do, you can't really ease that knot because it's just, if it just feels like it's in there. That the sensation of having a complex is like having this inexplicable hard spot that, that gets activated by seemingly small things. So I, up. so I think I have an example of this. Shall I tell yeah, you what it is? It. You can tell me if yeah, I'm right. No, so, um, I was thinking about when you said father and mother complexes. So you, uh, you showed me how to crochet mm -hmm. quite a while ago yeah. now. Yeah. And I remember that day. There I was with the, with the needles and the yarn and I'm working it's on just the one. It's just a hook. It's crochet. Knit oh, that's right. Knit has two needles. Crochet. It's been a while. Um, so I'm working on it and you were, you were explaining to me, told me how to do it and I would do it and then it wouldn't work. And I couldn't figure it out. And, and so you said, okay, well, let me show you. And you reached over and you took it out of my hand and everything went sideways from there on for because, a little while. Because you were no longer. Yep a 45 year old man, which is, I think no. the age you were at the time yeah. that this happened, yeah. you weren't that guy nope. anymore. Who were you? So I was the, uh, seven, eight year old boy who would Kenny. Yep. So cute. Yep. There he was trying to work on something in the basement with his father and his father would take it away from him and do it. And yeah. he'd just do the whole thing. Yeah um over and over again i mean so that was frustrating so all that frustration that so you I had, had memories yeah and I, had, you had, I had memories and, you had and my memories, body right? res my body responded yeah. first for sure um i didn't have any particular thoughts about it but my whole body just so, bristled and mm -hmm. locked up and and they it was connected to the feelings that i had the unresolved feelings that i had when i was a kid of my father just taking away and feeling helpless and feeling stupid and incompetent yeah. and uh, all of this. And it felt to me like you were directly saying to me, you're an idiot and you can't do this. Not that my father said that either. Right. But these There's are the a... things that I pulled to myself in it. Okay. So there's so much to go on. So there we go. There's a... I remember that moment too, because I reached over and I had been showing you and explaining you and everything was fine. Yeah. And there were Christmas cookies cooking in the background. And, and I reached over and said, okay, so I'm going to, I needed to fix something because you had dropped a loop and it yeah. needed. And yeah. oh my gosh, there was this unspooling. Yeah. 
And luckily... And like you said, it's very uncomfortable. They aren't yeah. always, but this one really is. Yeah, this one's very tender. Yeah. And you experienced it one way, and I was experiencing another thing. So I was still in my in myself. I was just myself. Right. I didn't know what was happening for you. But I got a clue because your voice changed. I could yeah. hear a change. You were having a really deeply embodied experience of a complex. So Jung described complexes as having autonomous agency. They they sort of act of their own volition. They Now, this does not excuse any behavior we choose to partake in as adults when our complexes choose to pop up. We are still responsible for all of our yeah. actions. Yep. But complex theory can help us understand that the... That's that feeling we get when we're like, oh my God, who was I? How did I, why was I doing that? Yep, I don't, or that's not, that's not me. me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. There it is. If you find yourself saying that, yeah, because it's not the you that you identify with most strongly. And yet there is this part of you that is profoundly impacted and reaches up and, and rises up and becomes the leader, becomes the front piece. All of a sudden, you've got a front man. You've and got somebody running the show. Let me tell you, you don't want the frustrated seven-year-old running your show as an adult. It's when not you have, ideal. It's not ideal. So you were just trying to crochet a baby owl. Yeah. You were just trying to make a little, a little owl Christmas ornament. It was nice and simple. It was adorable. You were doing great even. And then you had this moment. And what happened when you unspooled was luckily in that moment, um, I recognized that there was a problem pretty quickly. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I knew that there was a problem. So we went and had cookies not too long after. Which is a pretty good uh, treat for a seven-year-old. Yeah. So we went and had cookies. I didn't understand what had happened, but I knew something was wrong. And this is long before I really had all the words. I, so I wanted to point that out, that this was before your training, before yeah. you had the concepts fully down. So this isn't something that requires training to to no, live with it because this is just how people you're are. doing it already mm -hmm. it, and what we did was we we practiced um well we talked about it in an early earlier episode we practiced um self-regulation for each other for ourselves yes. and then some yeah. co-regulation like okay what's going on let's try to figure out and it was nice that what happened was actually a little extreme and it was about making something i feel incredibly competent about using my hands. It was to make your hands. comfort spot, com comfortable uh, spot. Hand me pretty much any, um, yeah, anything that needs to be made. Yep. I got it. I can do it. And if I don't know how to do it, I can teach myself in 25 minutes. That's my skill set. You struggle in this particular yep. area. And so because there was a, a big disparity there, I stayed in a sort of removed, curious posture. What the heck is going on? And watched. And as we soothed and got back down into like, okay, this isn't an, um, this isn't an emergency. As that little boy dropped back and, and, and was no longer running the whole show, you told me that story. You mm -hmm. told me what it felt like to have it taken out of your hands. And I remember you telling me a story about, um, were you making a sword yep. with your uh -huh. father? Wooden yeah, sword. A wooden sword. And you had this vision. You yeah. something you saw in your mind's eye yeah. and you wanted to make happen. And he offered to make it with you. But then it turned into just him taking it out of your hands, literally. Right. And making it. And the I could see and hear this, this broken hearted little boy. Right. That awakened in me deep compassion. Yay. Awesome. I didn't know what to do exactly, but I now knew that. Every time I ever tried to help you make something, I was going to refrain from just taking it out of your hands. And so what I did was I started asking if we were doing something like that, I would say, can I hold that or can I touch? Can that I touch was the hooks? extremely helpful. Right now. And, and that was, let me decide. Right. And let me look at it and decide and volunteer. And, the, and yeah. here's the thing that translated into our sex life really quickly. Which is a pretty helpful thing to because have. Because I didn't life. realize that that same little boy would show up, mm -hmm. would show up and be sort of petulant. And I didn't know exactly what was happening. Yeah, he wanted to be asked more questions. So, uh, 
I mean, a lot of people talk about turning curiosity on any tough topic, and I think it's a great move. But complex has helped me understand why. Because I'm a why person. I don't want, personally, I don't just want the how and what should I do. I want to know why. And complex theory helps me remember that there's a reason why you're behaving irrationally. There's a reason why I am like, I mean, the sight of a Christmas tree used to send my mother into tears. And so the sight of a Christmas tree used to send me into tears. And Mm -hmm. it was, I was way into my late twenties before I realized why. And it, the story is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. There's a, there's a long history there, but wow. Once I knew. So now when we unpack the Christmas tree, I know, I know how to create a bubble around myself Mm -hmm. to create safety, to make that. Okay. Because it's a Christmas tree. I want to enjoy it. But my, my, the, the part of me that is, that, that rises up the complex in me around holidays, celebrations, around my inner mother, not my actual mother who is, is gone now, but who I actually have a lot of compassion for the pain she felt around Christmas. Um, I, it's this inner part of me. It's not a, it doesn't have to be rational. And yet I am, like I said, I'm responsible for taking care of it. So yeah, that, what we that's did key. is we started and creating it me some a while safety. To, to figure that out, by the way, to really feel it, that Okay, so they have these complexes, and I'm still responsible for them because they're still me. <laughs> it's not like I can push it off onto this little kid and say it's his fault. Don't, I remember don't, the first time. Don't yell at me for it. It's his fault. No, that is you. I was studying. No, um, we, I, I think in in Lionel Corbett's class, I was studying. I was studying complexes, mm-hmm. and I was explaining them, and you were getting the language and the jargon down, and um, and we had an argument. Yeah. And you were behaving particularly petulantly. Mm-hmm. And I remember you like throwing something down on the bed and you were like, oh, like you've never had a complex. I was like, well, I mean, I have, but uh, what are we going to do now? Yeah. And it was a beautiful moment because I, I remember actually physically seeing you change like, oh, right. I'm oh, still yeah. responsible for what I actions I take. And so... When I'm thinking about complex Which theory, loops back to the regu- self-regulation that yep. we were talking about. So now about it's about previous episode, but yes. Yeah, pulling yourself back together and figuring out what to do with it. So some people who are listening are probably thinking, this sounds a lot like um parts work. Mm-hmm. About it sounds a lot like internal family systems and Dick Schwartz work around parts. And yeah, it does. It's incredibly similar. Um I'm not an IFS therapist. I'm a a Jungian psychologist instead. And so I use the language of complexes. But if the language of parts works well for you, think of it this way. You have all these parts and it's not just about stuff that happened to you. These, These parts, these complexes, they have an archetypal quality. And what that means is there are human patterns of behavior that have existed for all of humanity. The pattern of being a creature born of parents. There are, there just are parental, we're biologically created through parents. So there are these these ideas of parental figures. These patterns have an archetypal tone and texture and that gives them an incredible amount of, um, like overwhelming amount of power. And they're completely mundane. Like what's more mundane, more banal than a parent? Yep. I right? have it's a just, mom. I have a mom. I have a dad. Or I don't have a mom. I don't have a dad. I do have the, you're going to have the idea, the notion of parents and of being parented that exists in us. And so when something has an archetypal quality, we have, we have access to the collective experience of being human through these complexes to the archetypal quality and all people have connection to the archetypal qualities these patterns so other love is also you know an archetypal 
energy. And these are the things that um, child that f- energize, feed the complexes. What? Yeah. So was- there are ways of thinking about these different these these complexes, these parts. The archetypal energy reminds me that these are incredibly normal experiences, mm-hmm. but they're very very powerful. And some of them we can just sort of expect to see existing. So um, the hero, the idea of there being heroic action, the idea of there being a fix for things, the idea that we uh, exist in a world that needs heroes and needs heroic action. The concept of hero has, it, uh, has that archetypal quality and many people wind up with a a hero complex. In other words, this archetypal energy of the hero begins to take on a personal quality and we sort of incorporate it and it gets this psychological energy and it becomes like this, this little Velcro ball of like what it means to be a hero and all the movies that we see and the stories we hear, everything, all of it starts to glom onto and part of us might be tied up and wrapped up. Part of our life force is wrapped up in that idea of hero which then means that when something happens that we think touches it boom now this thing comes up and is active and so the hero complex is a really interesting one to think about so in parts work you would talk about how you know the the part comes out and it's in front it's it's running the show it's it now gets to stand in front of the curtain and everybody else is behind the curtain um i when when you're thinking about something like the hero complex being awakened, that's not a bad thing. But if it's awakened in an unconscious way and it's just running the show and there's no connection to a, a more centered and um, connected and I, there are a lot of ways to describe a higher self, a um, self leadership. There's, there's so yeah, many there's ways so many a divine ways to self connection to divinity. There's so many ways we could say this, but if, if the complex isn't able to be in connection to self, to your capital S self, um, well, complexes are by nature one-sided. They just, they are just this one thing. They're not the They're multifaceted. The yeah. So Nothing they are heroic, but... capital H heroic. Well, great. You know what heroes do? They try to save things that don't even ask to be saved. They try to fix things that yeah, never they're not to be all fixed, just right. So they have good. the heroic quality is a good thing in and of itself, and there's nothing wrong with it. But it doesn't mean that it's applicable in every situation. Sure. So when we are caught by the complex, when we are like just immersed in it, and we it is running the show, we are now acting in a way that is very one sided. And isn't necessarily appropriate to the situation we're in. So here we are in a relationship and um, you see me acting in a way that, uh, and this can go either way, right? Because I can do something that sets you off. Yep. That wakes up one of my complexes. Which then wakes up one of my, I mean, oh, yeah. it could have been my complex to set up yep. your complex. So. Um, yeah, we can just be two people with like complexes or to use parts work words to to two parts to yep. acting at each other acting at each other so what's what's the move here we are what do we do yay okay so there are a lot of moves there are tips and tricks tips and tricks no <laughs> there tips are the tips. there are things we can do to bring ourselves into relation and one of the things is we can remember that we are multiple we are not sometimes when I first explain this to people, there's a little moment of panic when people are like, what do you mean? I'm multiple. That sounds like some sort of identity disorder. I have enough trouble with this one of me. What do you mean? There's two. And Um, my own father struggled with this a lot. He wanted there to be this one unified whole, mm -hmm. um, undifferentiated. He wanted to just, and, and that was a big struggle when I would say, well, what about this part of you that might want something else? When, when you think about complexes and how we're setting each other off, you can think about how there are parts of us that are disconnected from a, a, a grounded, mature, um, 
soulful self. Mm -hmm. And when that part is running the show and it's not in communication with your, with yourself, with your capital yeah. S self, yeah. um, well, it's going to act in a one-sided manner. It's going to see every, if it, imagine it's a hammer, everything, you know, it's going to treat everything like a nail, right? Yeah. So it's not that complexes are necessarily bad. It's that they are one-sided. They, they lead you in a one-sided move. And so in order to shift away from that, we have to allow ourselves to be more than one thing at a time. And I, I love that. I find that experience to be good in both directions. So for me, when I find myself acting in this one-sided way, if I can get myself to notice it, I can remember that that's not all I am. Right. But also in relation to you, when you have a complex up and you are exemplifying <laughs> something that is not working for me, I can remember that that's not all you are, that there's more to you. And I don't have to get wrapped up in just what's happening right now in this moment. I can remember that there's there's more of you. And then try to talk to some of the other pieces. Is there anyone else there I could talk to? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good move. So what, that's actually a great move. Um, an example that comes up in my life is that when I get a migraine, there is a part of me that the pain is immense anyways, but there is a part of me that is terrified because I watched many, many, many very sick people in my life and I watched them fall apart and I watched them die and I watched it happen in pain. And so there is a part, and this started happening when I was very, 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 as well, my whole life, literally my whole life. So there is a part of me when I am experiencing pain that if it comes out and it's the front of me is petrified and basically pre-verbal yeah. like uh, unable to manage anything that isn't all of me and the interesting thing is if i am like if i'm out being responsible in the world that that will never happen i can be in a, i have taught eight hour lecture classes and through that same pain because people needed me so other parts of me were coming to the front mm -hmm. but in a time when i can relax one of these younger complexes, one of these more tender, delicate pieces can be in the front. And that's when sharing this language, really the whole reason for this episode is to give you another way to talk about what's going on when nothing makes sense, when yeah. your partner doesn't make sense yeah. to you. Because one of the things you do for me is if you see that happening, you see the the pain, you see the little, this little like, uh, person that I am. And it's not, I don't think I act childishly, I, childishly. Is that the right way? Yeah. To say it? Yeah. So much as I can no longer seem to ask for exactly what I need. Yep. And I, I look, I, I've seen my own eyes in the mirror when this happens. I look panicked. Yep. Um, it. And so I have learned to, uh, uh, well, I've learned to watch for these kinds of things. So when things don't make sense, and sometimes it's enough for you to just say, oh, I, I see that you, you're you having an experience. And and then it's about just getting me to a safe spot. Like all I need to do is get to a safe spot yep. where I can now come back into relationship with more parts of myself and eventually come into relationship with myself. Like, right, there is a, there is a part of me that's not touched by all of the stuff that's happening. Yeah. It, this is a this is big work, by it the way. Is this is this, big work. This has taken an entire decade of consistent everyday work on my part to get to the point where this is second nature. This is just how I how I exist in the world. So I'm not saying that this is just like boom, you're just going to pick this stuff up tomorrow. But coming into a bringing yourself capital S self, your, your higher self, figure out what you want to call it. Who do you want to call that? You're the, the, the part of you. It's not just your, it's not your ego. Your ego is a complex. Your ego gets to run the show, your persona, the parts of you that you show to the world, those get to be complexes too. But the self is, it is all the complexes and it is connected to everything. It connects you to something so much larger than 
any singular point of consciousness. Yeah, the 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 word complex is so useful here because it is. It's a very very complex system. You've there are all kinds of interconnections. Um, and what has been so helpful to me is knowing that there um, there's something to like understand here. It's not just people acting irrationally. It's a person with many facets, many parts, and you've talked about facets before, um, this another maybe way of looking at this, but there you are, and I don't understand what's happening right now because the way you're behaving doesn't seem in line with what I'm used to. And that can be destabilizing and scary for me. Yeah. Um, but if I remember or, and when I remember that you are more than just that, that, um, that, that average of all of your behaviors that I sort of hold you up against. When I remember that there's more of you than that, then I have the opportunity to dig in and say, so what's happening right now? This is normal. What's happening, even though it's not what usually happens, it is normal. Yeah. So let's, let's see what's going on and start trying to figure out how to have a conversation with this particular way of being that you're in right now. So this all comes down to what um, the the psychologist Adolf Guggenbull Craig called the soteriological mm -hmm. relationship. The soteriological relationship is about having a, a salvational purpose to your relationship. That the idea that the two of us and I have done this with other partners as well, are, are on a path together in our individuation journey. We're not, we're not fused. We're not one, nor are we only separate. Yeah, nor are we isolated. We are, we have decided to engage in this exchange of energy and time and beingness. And the, Having the capacity to see each other in these complicated messes and say, yep, so this mess is part of what it is to be normal. It invites patience while, while not excusing behavior. That's, that's key. While yeah. not saying, yeah. so um, it doesn't matter that you, that you hurt me. Right. It doesn't I... matter that I, that I, um, went outside of our relationship agreement yeah. or that I, that I hurt someone else or that I, I, I'm not behaving in ways that are conducive to just a, a, a healthy, happy home life. Right. Patience doesn't that. mean abandoning your boundaries. Not at all. Not Absolutely at all. not. No, it does that's not. not the idea. Full stop. Um, but when we talk about being present for each other, we're talking about being present to an individuation process. Because let's be clear, nobody's individuated. It's there yeah, is no there's, there's no, no end there's no that. end. Yeah. You're in a process, and that's being in the mess. And so the language of complexes, the language of oh, you've got all this stuff going on there, and it's going to be a different set of stuff that formed these these energy nodules in you, like yeah. different set for you than for me. Um, lets us also tell the difference between, hey, just because you have been sucked into an archetypal vortex <laughs> doesn't mean that I am right, right now. Right. That's my vortex. I can I can witness you in the pain mm -hmm. or struggle or anger that you're in without yep. responding to it as if it's happening to me. Yeah. Just yeah. It took let me a long be. time to figure that one out. And that has been that's been huge. So the next thing to do with this is actually um, it's about projection and oh. projective identification. Oh. And there's a whole, yeah. there's a whole long way to go with that. We're going to do another whole episode. We're getting into the, <laughs> the, the master's level, yeah, this uh, is the graduate studies of relating studies. at this point. So I'm totally jazzed. Anybody who's listening to these episodes, because this is an up leveling this is. is this is up leveling the game big time people we're going to talk about projection very soon um and if you have questions about complexes or if you're thinking what the heck is this i'm going to put a few recommendations for some great books to start off with in the show notes um 
this is a huge topic. I have an entire library full of books on just this topic. So take a deep breath and know that there is so much out there to explore in this way. And while analytical psychology, Jungian psychology tends to be focused on the individual and the inner experience, personally, I have chosen to approach Jungian psychology through a relational lens. There is so much for us to learn when we apply these concepts to our relationships. So we'll be coming back to this over and over again because it is absolutely my signature. It is what I do differently. I have found it to be typical. so extremely useful. And I welcome your questions. Even if you're not sure exactly what the question is, it's okay to sort of hash something together and say, send it off. Um, Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. And I'm more than happy to answer questions along these lines. I don't have the training, but if you do have questions for me, Ken at JolieHamilton.com. I have experience, but no training. Experience being a mess. Being a me mess. Too. Yay. Okay, go be messy. Talk to each other. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love, is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.